So I'm here to talk about sitemaps. Uh, it's content discovery protocol, uh, which is useful in finding information, which is there in web applications. <clears throat> but before I start, how many of you have heard of sitemaps before? OK. All right, then I'll go through it faster, and we can have more Q&A at the end. So to start with, what is the problem we are trying to solve? Really, the problem is of hidden web. What happens is there's a lot of content on the web which is not really accessible through links. And most of the classic search engines, such as Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, they go through the web by crawling the public links and, and you know, exposing that entire graph, uh, exploring that entire graph. And what they end up finding is estimated to be really around, you know, 4% of what uh, the, or, or less than 2% actually, of, of what really the, uh, the whole web is. And the reason behind that is that there is a lot of non-HTML links, links which are not inside HTML documents, which are linked otherwise to the web. There are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of content hidden behind cookied links. And cookie links are things where, you know, you go to a site with a cookie and you see a different piece of content compared to you when you see it without a cookie. And obviously, crawlers do not store cookies and they do not post them back. Uh, cookie links result in uh, exposed content which is not otherwise accessible to uh, the search engines. Then there are search forms. You go to a site, there is a form, you fill out information in there, you hit submit, and a whole bunch of content from the database which is backing that application shows up onto the uh, web page. But search engines usually will not go and fill out forms. And finally, of course, rich and interactive applications. You have a Flash application, you have an Ajax application. Uh, you, it's very hard to really expose all the content within through what is traditionally URLs uh, linking to HTML content. So all those things indicate that there is a lot of uh, hidden content on the web. And interestingly, sitemaps, when it tries to solve this problem, obviously the result it shoots for is higher coverage in terms of uh, content which is discovered. But some of the side effects also show up such as you can have fresher results. You can have content classification uh, done. And a lot of metadata detection also can be part of sitemaps. And all of this will enable much richer usage of this hidden content. And that's what we'll, we'll look at today. And we will uh, go over some examples. So what is the current state of sitemaps? Sitemaps currently is uh, supported by three major search engines, <coughs> Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. The protocol was initially developed by Google in, in 2005 and then uh, published under uh, Creative Commons license and was considered an industry standard when the three major search engines uh, got together and adopt, said, uh, supported and adopted it. Now, there are many content-specific formats also which are available which are within sitemaps, and we will look at some of those examples. Um, these have been defined with help uh, from partners, from, by search engines. Also, sitemaps is today in use by many Fortune 500 companies and federal government, um, and many other uh, enterprises are looking at it very actively as a solution to the hidden web problem. And most recently, November of last year, uh, we announced, uh, we as in, as in Google announced uh, a pilot program with GoDaddy whereby even uh, uh, webmasters who have their sites hosted at uh, these uh, commercial hosting companies could actually take advantage of automatic sitemap generation and publication to expose uh, hidden content. So that was announced in 2007. The question is, can it help you? If you are somebody who deals with AJAX applications, if you build applications on top of large CMS systems, if you have fast changing content in your uh, application, or if you have multimedia or rich content, or if you're using custom search engines, almost all of these cases, sitemaps are something which you should consider. 
I'll give you an example from Dell's product support website. Uh, before that, I, I would start with a basic premise that most of the time, if, if you, for example, have a Dell laptop and you have a problem, most of the users will end up going to a general search engine and they will type in there what their problem is and they'll expect a link to a site which will help them solve that. Not as many will directly go to support.dell.com or a place like that. They would, they would usually first say, oh, let me Google it or let me, let me go to Yahoo, Microsoft and, and go find what happens. Now, let's take that example. If you went to uh, support.dell.google.com, this is what you would see. It is a very interactive application. It helps you find your laptop. It helps you locate exactly what problem you're having. It'll help you download updates to the drivers. But if you went to Google and you tried to f find the same problem, and suppose you were really a very uh, sophisticated user and you were able to tell that what you really needed was a new audio driver for a specific type of Dell laptop. If you Googled it, this is what would show up. And as you can imagine, none of these are really from Dell. And from Dell's perspective, they have invested in building up this support uh, application, put it out there. Their users should have a very good experience when they come across a problem. And you might even notice uh, down here, if it shows, the last example over there is DellDrivers.com. Now, if you're not sophisticated, you might feel that, oh, Dell has set up this website, DellDrivers.com. But if you look it up, DellDrivers.com is owned by somebody in Beijing. And it's not obvious that they have a relation to Dell. Now, Dell users are ending up with this experience because the application design is actually not able to expose all the information it has. So how do you go and solve that? Actually, another point of interest is it's not really a ranking problem. It's not that these results are ranking higher. If you restrict the search only to Dell, you will see that most of the time, what people, what, what Google has found are search result pages as a result of other people doing searches on Dell, which are probably links from forums and so on and so forth. People do a search, they find some information, and then they'll link to it on a forum. But there is no systematic, consistent way by which Dell is exposing that information. Now, this is, this is just one example. And you can imagine how much, uh, how valuable it would be if the user was finding the information directly from the most authentic source. Now that, of course, is not happening, and it is a discovery problem. So the question is, how can it be solved? And now we will go into the protocol where I will, I will try to go over what exactly is possible in this protocol and go through how you can, in, in different cases, and not all the problems are, you know, not all the questions are answered here. So certain cases, if you identify a situation, we have ways whereby you can go and extend the protocol to solve your own problems. And uh, we will go through that as well. And uh, finally, uh, we'll look at an example of how someone like, you know, for example, Dell could have done something whereby the minute they find a problem and they publish it on their support site, they can actually expose it to all the search engines. So the protocol. Some of the topics to discuss in here is the definition. What exactly does a protocol look like? What are the different formats of sitemaps which are, uh, extend, uh, which are acceptable? And how can you extend them if needed? How do you create sitemaps? How can you submit them? And what are the challenges and opportunities? So looking at the definition, a sitemap really is a, is a list of URLs. In, in, in the most simplistic sense, you can think of it as a list of URLs which you are submitting to anybody saying, these are all the possible ways I serve content out of my applications. You can think of it even as an example of doing, you know, ls-al at the root of uh, your, con or ls-alr uh, at the root of the content folder and listing out everything which is available, uh, you know, at the content folder and saying, well, this is my sitemap. But obviously, there are different formats which we accept. Uh, the simplest format which is acceptable in, in terms of sitemaps is plain text. You can just give a simple list of URLs, which anybody can go and retrieve and look at the content. You can also publish RSS format, so you can leverage any infrastructure you have to generate RSS. And finally, there's an XML document. If uh, there's XML schema provided for sitemaps, and if you have a document that follows that schema, you can publish that as well. 
And we'll look at that as the most common uh, example. Now, the key thing to note is that it is not the HTML sitemap, which is really what many of the websites have on them, is a HTML page with links to all important parts of their site. That is not really what we are talking about here. Plain text. Now, plain text is very simple. You can do plain text. You can put, uh, now we are, we are talking right now about formats. We will go through how do you create them, how do you submit them to search engines. But the format, you can have a plain text format where you just have a straightforward UTF-8 encoded uh, list of URLs. An RSS feed is relatively uh, better because it does tell us when was that page last modified. But uh, other than the link and the modified, most of the other stuff in those feeds is ignored. But the benefit of that is that the work in generating those is a lot lesser for many of the web applications. And the downside is it might lack comprehension depending on how you are generating uh, these feeds. And it does not allow for much more metadata. But the uh, recommended way to create sitemaps is in XML. Um, an example is uh, given over here. XML schema is published on sitemaps.org. Uh, you can create an XML document. It, it allows you to have a whole URL set. You can uh, put one URL after another. And you can tell when was it last modified, how often does it change, what is the priority in your mind of that content on that URL compared to other content on your site. And you can generate all this, and then you can publish it to uh, the search engines. Now, the, the key thing to note is uh, location is the only required part. Uh, everything else is optional. But what makes this protocol most interesting, and, and why is it uh, most recommended by the search engines, is the fact that it is extent extensible. As you can see here, some of the very basic fields are there. But if you have, for example, a uh, new kind of extension you want to provide because your content is a little different. And we will look at some examples, for example, news and video content, how they can extend this protocol. Uh, if your content is a little different, what you need to do is really define a new namespace and then have tags from that namespace in here. Now, Google has worked with partners to define new kind of extensions, and there's some of them in Actually, I'm hoping that as more and more rich applications are built, people can propose new extensions as well, uh, because obviously it is you know, something which we need to work on and, and uh, make this protocol more useful. But here are a couple of examples. Uh, the news websites, they have uh, partnered on, with us. And you can find these examples on code.google.com. Uh, there are news publication date and keywords, which are extensions to the content. You can imagine, we, when we get a URL saying, this is where my article is, otherwise search engines have to go figure out what are the important keywords in here. This is a way for somebody to tell what are the important keywords in this, in addition to publication date. Now, these extensions at times will look like meta tags, but there are examples where they might not be like meta tags over here. Uh, but the, the point to note is that this is very specific to the kind of content which is available on that URL, and there is a lot of freedom in defining this part of the XML fragment. Uh, video content, for example, you can say whether uh, one can embed this or not. You can even say what does the thumbnail look like. You can tell where the uh, player is. And this will allow any kind of video content to come with all the information that is required for people who then try to use it to be able to understand. You can have other things, for example, which is obviously not here, but a, uh, an example could be if you had a video stream and a subtitle stream, you could probably link it over here in that extension, and that will couple the two together even if those are found at different URLs. So these are the different ways you can provide extensions. Now the question is, how do you create Google sitemaps? Easiest to get started is Google sitemaps. Uh, how do you create sitemaps? So the easiest to get started is Google sitemap generator. It's a customizable Python script available on uh, code.google.com. You can go download it. You can customize it to your particular uh, settings on the web server. And it will go and uh, figure out uh, all the possible URLs which you serve. And it will generate sitemaps for you. 
There are a lot of third-party tools available as well, uh, which can generate sitemaps for you. And obviously, ideally, from an application developer's perspective, you should never have to worry about generating sitemaps. It should be something given to you by the infrastructure you work on. <coughs> Just like if you're a blogger, you never have to worry about writing up the RSS file for the blog post you just made. It is automatically available through the blogging platform. So content management systems are probably the best place to generate comprehensive sitemaps right out of the gate. And we'll look at some examples. And, and there are some uh, CMS systems which have started looking at how to do this. Because they are the best place where all the metadata can easily be extracted and be published. But suppose you have generated uh, these sitemaps using one of these three methods. Now, the third method, of course, is depending on the content management system you are using. But suppose you have generated one using one of these three methods. How do you submit them? The simplest way to submit is put a link in your robots.txt. And the minute you put a link in your robots.txt file, all the major search engines will pick it up. It's a simple sitemap colon you know, wherever your file is. And that file can be an XML file, can be RSS file, whatever, whatever you want. Then you can also do an HTTP ping. This is a very interesting approach. It's you generate new content, you put, it, you put the link over there, you can tell anybody interested, I have generated new content. And that is where the side effects of, you know, quick discovery, fresh, uh, results in search pages, all that comes up. And going back to the Dell example, ima imagine the case where a new problem is found with your audio driver. Dell publishes a new knowledge base article. And does uh, the sitemap, the CMS system they use, does the sitemap generation, and the system pub uh, pings uh, all the major search engines using uh, HTTP ping. And search engines go pick up that document, find the new uh, content, index it, and make it available. You can have, as a matter of fact, you know, within hours, what was there on Dell.com be also reflected on major search engines, which is where users are very likely to end up looking for solutions to their problems. <coughs> and of course, uh, different uh, search engines have provided uh, user interfaces where you can go and manually submit things. So if you want to test out things, if you want to look at if your sitemaps, has, my sitemaps have errors or not, you can, for example, go to google.com slash webmaster slash tools. You will be able to add your site and say, here is my sitemap. And it will tell you whether the sitemap has any problems in it or not. Now, here is an example of how you can use uh, ping and CMS for fast discovery. Uh, going back to the Dell example, uh, someone within uh, any uh, company which, is, uh, you know, which has a large deployment there'll be probably a writer who writes the content which is supposed to be served out through this web application. Once they write the content, they submit it to the CMS system, like let's say Documentum. They'll go submit it in there, and that CMS system goes through a promotion method. You know, uh, you can imagine even in terms of blogs, you could have a way that somebody goes and says, okay, here is an uh, article, then you publish it, then it goes through the editor or manager or whoever is the approver approves it, and once they approve, the, the CMS system promotes it for publication. And whenever it is promoted for publication, the, the content is flagged. OK, here is something which can go out on the website. In Dell example, it could be a knowledge base article. Somebody writes up a knowledge base article. Somebody else reviews it, says, yes, this looks good. This will solve the user's problem. Let's publish it. When it goes for publication, there is usually a content delivery process which runs. And in picking the example of Documentum, what, ex what happens is that Whatever the CMS system is, it reflects how the site will look. So the, uh, the content delivery process really picks all the content and applies a new uh, version, uh, copies a new version over to the site. So this con uh, content delivery process is where you can extract the metadata and you can generate sitemaps right there. And once you generate sitemaps, you can put that in robots.txt and ping it. And the minute you do that, you know, the search engines are the ones, the ball is in their court. They'll, they'll come, they'll pick it up, and then they will make it available in search results. So you can imagine earlier the situation would have been you write content, submit it, editor approves, its uh, content delivery process runs, 
and the content is available. But in nobody who is coming to look at uh, that content to a general purpose search engine will ever be able to find it because it stops right here. And depending on the structure of your application and the example I gave of uh, Dell support websites, you cannot really make it easy for somebody after the, the, to connect the output of this to this without actually going through this process. It will always be ad hoc. People will be posting links on forums and stuff. But the results here will never be comprehensive, representative of what actually has happened here. So this part is, is very important. And if you build a CMS system, I would strongly recommend that you go and you know, build out this piece into your uh, uh, product because you are providing infrastructure which your users will actually derive immense value out of. It's like if you're building a blogging platform, would you think of building RSS uh, support in there or not? And if you are not, uh, if you are somebody who is actually creating applications which deliver content, you probably either want to uh, build this box out for yourself or present a request to the CMS system so to say that, okay, let's go and you know, make this happen. And you can imagine if that does, between editor approving that something should be on the site to this, this is all automated. From here, these two are the manual processes. Once this is done, everything else from here is automated. So you will be able to see results without human intervention, you know, with as fast as things can happen on the web. Now, what does the current ecosystem look like? You know, who are the people who are currently supporting sitemaps? What are they doing? Uh, some of the current players. Obviously, search engines, which care a lot about end users, they are there. Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Ask. Uh, they all look at sitemaps. They all support sitemaps. The reason they do that is because users are interested in dynamic content application. Search engines are interested in making the users happy. So they are all supporting this. From the point of view of content uh, publishers, all government agencies, Fortune 500 organizations, news and community sites. I, I showed you examples of extensions which are out there. Uh, there are... Uh, if you, if you go and uh, look at U.S. government, you can usually go to large sites and say slash robots are text and look at their robots are text, and you will find in there, like, you know, try hp.com. Go in there, and you will find in there there's sitemaps colon, and there's a sitemap link because they want to expose more and more of the content. And for the same reason, because if they expose more content, users are going to search engines, they'll find them. Now, system integrators and hosters are also starting to support these. I gave the example of uh, GoDaddy. GoDaddy is uh, number one hoster uh, in, in US. They, their users can, uh, when you have a GoDaddy account, you can automatically generate sitemaps. They will submit it on your behalf to Google. They'll also provide you single sign-on access to the UI which we have so that you can come in and see what actually is happening with your site. Wipro Technologies is a large system integrator which uh, is looking at uh, integrating sitemaps into all the uh, commercial applications they go and build for large companies. And of course, Google Search Appliance, IBM right now, and the variety of open source projects which are technology vendors which are supporting sitemaps so that dynamic content applications can leverage them right away. So this is the current picture uh, in terms of the uh, sitemaps ecosystem. You can find which box do you belong to, and if there's something missing, please tell me. Uh, but you can see what are the reasons why people in that area are looking at this technology and uh, might want to consider it. But obviously, not everything is figured out. And uh, some of the key challenges, one of the biggest ones is that there is more guidance needed around calculation of uh, metadata of different kind of content. I gave you an example of news and video, the kind of extensions we have published. But of course, if you know, it doesn't work for you, there is no clear process right now on how you can go and uh, you know, change that extension. The only process is you go define a new uh, namespace, you add your own tags, and you can publish it. But that will lead to a lot of uh, fragmentation. But once the activity picks up, we will come up with a way that we can uh, bring everybody together. Today, probably, the way is to really talk to people from those uh, search engines. Um, now, the second big problem over here is, is of relevance. As you can imagine, a lot of content 
in the linked web was really ranked and in terms of relevance by the links pointing to them. You know, PageRank is, you know, a well-known algorithm which depends on how the links, how the pages link to each other. But as you can imagine, when you are de generating this uh, list of dynamic content, there is no easy way to measure relevance. And that is one of the key challenges which we are, uh, within Google itself, working on them. Okay, you know, there's so much content out there which doesn't have a lot of links. How do we make sure that it is still relevant to the users who want them? And that is an unanswered question in the sense that we cannot come and say, this is what you do, but we are very aware of that and we work on that every day. And the third one, which is a big one, is how do you avoid spam? Which probably is rel uh, related to relevance because now there's an automated way to tell search engines about a lot of content. How can you make sure that this automated process does not result in spamming uh, either the search engine index or the search results. That's a problem, again, which we uh, work with on a regular basis. But the benefits are quite a bit. Uh, it helps end users find hidden content in a web application through general and custom search engines. I gave you the example of the Dell support website. It has a, that application has content which is hidden, but it would be available through general and custom search engines. And um, we did announce this some time ago that if you submit a sitemap, even if your pages do not show up on Google.com, we will include them in the custom search engines you build for your site. So you could publish a lot of content. You could uh, publish a sitemap for it. You could create a custom search engine. And we would use all the content which you have given us in the sitemap to be included in that custom search engine. And of course, increase the freshness of content your application publishes. In the previous example, once the editor approved that, yes, this content is ready to uh, go out, from that time to the time it was available in search engines was all automatic process. There was nothing manual, and it can really increase freshness to the extent possible by the technology. And enable new applications to be built by defining and, and using different sitemaps metatypes. So looking at the video type, you know, there is video can say, yes, I can be embedded if you can use this player to embed me. Now that is something which is not only useful for a search engine, it actually is metadata available through robots.txt out to, for anybody on the web to look at, and that can make it uh, really useful for any other application, whether it is a mashup or anything else, to say, oh yeah, this is exactly what this content is capable of. Let me go and use it that way. So those are the challenges and opportunities, um, and that is my presentation. Do you guys have any questions? And if you do, please come up to the mic so uh, we can record those. Hi. Could you tell me Google's official position on how listing your images in the sitemap is going to relate to Google Images? Uh, how what in sitemaps? If you list your Googles mm -hmm. in your XML sitemap, mm -hmm. will that have any effect on Google Images? If you list an image in Google sitemaps, will it have uh, any effect on Google Images? Correct. You mean image search? N yes, correct. There is a image sitemap extension, I believe. So uh, you can use that. I mean, any content you submit in there is available for us to crawl, and we'll figure out where to use it. Within the XML sitemap? Yes, within the XML okay, sitemap. Okay, thank yes. you. Uh, hi. So when you do the ping, do you, are you supposed to update the entire sitemap or just uh, anything that's changed? When you do the ping, you are giving us the URL of the sitemap. If it is an existing one, uh, you should include all the new stuff and leave the old stuff there. If it is a new one, then it doesn't matter. So but we will figure out what the delta is. Can you submit multiple sitemaps? If you have like you know a million URLs, yes. how is the best way to handle that? Yes, you can uh, submit multiple sitemaps. You can also... and. It's given on sitemaps.org in that schema area that if you have a lot of uh, sitemaps, what you can do is you can fragment them and then you can create an index sitemap and you can submit that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, that this will work uh, with custom uh, searches. Would this work with a mini or a Google appliance? Will it work with mini or Google appliance in terms of consuming it? Yes. 
I believe that they are able to produce it. Okay. I don't know whether they consume it or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Uh, I do know that they produce sitemaps uh, based on what they find, but I don't know whether they consume it or not. If the spider can reach all of your content by just crawling, is there any value to doing a sitemap? If the spider can reach all the content, uh, I think that one value which you will see uh, in this example is the freshness is one value, that you can actually tell the spider that I changed something. The second value probably is the fact that you can provide a lot of metadata, which otherwise will have to be inferred. Uh, not that you know, the indexing pipeline would stop inferring that, but uh, having that metadata does give a hint as to what the webmasters think about that. So those would be probably the two reasons. What's the main benefit of using the namespaces in the sitemap? Does that increase relevance to those links? Like if you have a video tag around a video link? No, those are to provide extensions to sitemaps. Uh, for example, uh, if you, if you look at sitemap just by itself, it actually does not allow any kind of special data about the content. But if you give a namespace, that allows you to add new tags which are in their own namespace. So then you can add extensions saying, this is my video extension and here is all the stuff about the video. That does tell us that that content in the URL is a video and here is additional metadata about that. Uh, just in case I have a really big uh, website with uh, 100,000 of uh, URLs mm -hmm. and uh, I have uh, five uh, URLs are modified. Okay. Uh, in, in my eyes, it must, doesn't make sense that I submit uh, all the 250 or 500,000 URLs again with this ping function. So uh, in the ping function, you can point us to any sitemap. You can yeah. either update the previous one by changing the last modified dates. Yeah. We will figure those differences out. Or you can put them in a separate URL and, and a separate uh, XML and remove one from the other one. Some people might say that actually going through all my content and regenerating the entire thing is easier than figuring out the deltas which happen. Uh, others might not. So it, it's, it's your choice. Uh, either way, it's fine. But that would say that I have to create uh, only sitemaps with unique URLs. So uh, just in case I have this big list of sitemaps mm -hmm. and uh, I have also uh, the modified uh, URL listed okay. in this uh, sitemap and then I create uh, another one which is called new uh, URLs uh, and I submit only this one. Okay. Uh, I ask this because uh, I uh, noticed that uh, in the Google Webmaster Tools mm -hmm. that uh, most uh, of, from uh, a lot of my sitemaps, only uh, 70 or 80 percent of all URLs are indexed uh, from that sitemap. That is a different problem. Sitemap does not imply indexing. No, uh, it's so the information you get in the Webmaster Tools that um, Google tells you uh, you have 250,000 URLs. And we have indexed yet uh, 230. Uh, and uh, most of them are the latest ones. So that will say uh, all, everything I created uh, two or three or maybe six weeks ago is never indexed. So my, my experience is uh, if I uh, create uh, some good links to, to this page, uh, they are indexed within one or two days, sometimes only in hours. If I wait on sitemaps, maybe I wait too long. I think I would be cautious of drawing that causal, causal inference. I mean, adding links or y you might find URLs which have no links to them still being indexed by us. If well, you all my sites are good indexed uh, or linked uh, to each other. So it's not a problem with that uh, these uh, pages are not indexable. But uh, it's uh, yeah, just you, you use all both of them. You use a good link structure and you use sitemaps to get uh, all your pages into the index. So, but sometimes it doesn't work, even with sitemaps. Okay, I, I gave you the example of mm -hmm. uh, Dell, right? I mean, Dell is a very popular yeah. and very reputed site. And it has pages which, you know, without doing anything, we can, we can only find the ones which other users are putting links to on forums. 
and we decide looking at those links whether they are uh, good or not. Now what I'm saying is that saying that because you added links is why they got indexed and if you gave sitemaps and they didn't get indexed, I would say that that is something, if it appears that way, you should not consider that it's a causal thing because, uh, I mean, I can tell you that when you submit a sitemap or you link to it from somewhere else, to us, we know about the content at this point. And then we'll look at all the other things we know about it. Um, yeah. Maybe it's also a thing of authority with the Dell uh, website. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there a best practice to submit a widget uh, page or a flash heavy website? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Uh, is there a, what are the best practices to submit a widget uh, page? For example, a lot of widgets coming in. Yeah, uh, so if you have a widget page which actually retrieves content from uh, the back end and, and right. shows it depending on the interaction, uh, you probably have to, I mean, there, there are a couple of ways we, this is where we want to start that dialogue, right? I mean, there are possible ways that you can provide an extension where you say, you know, this widget is really equivalent to the content served by these 10 other URLs depending on the parameters. Mm -hmm. Or you can say that, for other kind of sites which do not support JavaScript, this is where the user would go, and as a result, please go crawl these. So uh, we we are right now in, in the process of looking at how can you use things like extensions to provide a better, meaningful structure whereby you can say widgets, flash applications, and so on and so forth. How can you retrieve content out of that and say, you know, this thing, that content actually sits over there. Because you cannot interact with this widget, go retrieve that instead. And if you want to show anybody, show this. But this is an unanswered question, and I would be happy to look at examples and you know discuss how we could do specific things Thanks. in that case. Uh, related to having large sites and multiple sitemaps, is there a problem with putting the same URL in multiple sitemaps? I tell you, the, uh, my reason for saying this is I have one site that has about 3 million pages. And obviously with the 50,000 URL per sitemap and then the sitemap indexes, regenerating sitemaps for the entire site is very time consuming. But if I've updated one, one page, I know I've updated that one page, it's, it's easy for me to have an updated sitemap that I generated at that moment and then regenerate my entire set of sitemaps later that evening. Uh, is there a problem with overlap? No, there is not. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead and generate that and ping us and you know go ahead and update the whole thing later. So there's no problem with having the same URL show up in two no, sitemaps? No. Okay, thank you. Not at all. So uh, I need to use uh, sitemaps for some URLs that work uh, under Ajax. Mm -hmm. So what can I do there? So if, the U, if there are URLs to that content, which is in your Ajax application, then you can take those URLs and, and put them in a sitemap separately. Even if, if the content is dyna dynamic? So uh, let, me, let me give you an example. Th there are two kind of things you can have, right? Well, one is where your Ajax application really does not reflect its state in, in the URL. And another example is where actually it does. Uh, say, let's pick the example of Gmail. You can go and search in Gmail, and your URL will reflect what the content on the page is going to look like, because it will capture the fact that you have done a search. But that is something which is not something you can start with. You know, so what you can do is, if you have such URLs, then you can go and publish them. That's one of the problems. That's the non-HTML link problem, that the page doesn't have HTML. These URLs are automatically generated by JavaScript. So you can go and you can put them. The other way you can do it is uh, you can look at what the user actions are and you can log and you can look at popularity and then you can go from there. That's part of the work GoDaddy does. The hardest problem is when your entire application state doesn't change and content is retrieved from different places and placed depending on the past sequence of events. If you try to start the application, it'll again start exactly from there. There's no way to go to in the middle of the state of, of an application. So if that is the case, in that case, you either have to change or we can talk about can we use extensions. Uh, extensions could be a possible use in that case. Um, 
let's say there is a monolithic uh, Flex or Flash application that has several tabs or sections, and mm -hmm. each section is actually linkable through um, a query-based URL. Okay. So depend, depending on, on, on the tab that I want to see, I have a different query in the URL. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense to put those queries in, in an XML uh, sitemap? Yes, it, it would make sense to put them in there because that will allow us to get to those particular tabs. The question is when we get there, do we capture anything or not? Uh, an example, recently uh, Adobe, for example, launched Photoshop Express. Have you guys used it? It's an online Photoshop application. They have a lot of content on the page. But almost everything, and, and you can link to it, but everything which comes back is actually either image which has text in it, so we cannot really tell it without actually parsing the image out, or is a Flash application which is rendering text on it. If you search for it, you will find nothing, right? I mean, if you go search on Google for text which is on that page, you will not find it. Uh, snippets will not show you anything. So, so the problem is that even if we get to it, can we understand what is in there? And in that case, the way we are thinking is, uh, you know, working with people uh, who use these and understanding what is the right extension we can build, whereby you know, people who build Flash applications can say, you know, this is the general set of things which we do when we are building Flash apps so that the extension reflects that equally well. And then from, if we manage to do that, then at that point, whenever you uh, build a Flash app, you can actually say, my Flash application has these other parameters which will help us understand what is inside. So you're saying that at this point there's no way you can actually s see if that content is actually um, relevant for the search? If all your content is within Flash, yes. Okay, thanks. Even if, uh, if you link to it, we'll know there is stuff there. But if it is all within Flash, we'll have to figure out what extensions make sense. Hi, so the approach that I'm doing, I'm sort of doing the same type of thing but with uh, Microsoft Silverlight. Mm -hmm. And the approach that I'm doing, I just want to make sure this is all perfectly legit, mm -hmm. is that if I'm rendering it in a, for basically to be crawled, I'll, it won't look the same, but it'll have the same content. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the, the browser version, uh, the, the, the non-scripting, non-scripted version of the same content. How, how do you know whether it is... Do you use a look at the user agent to figure this out? It's either looking at the user agent or uh, if it isn't, uh, if they don't have the, uh, the the plugin installed. Same with Flash or, or Silverlight. So okay. what, what what is the right practice to do? Checking the user agents to see if it's th see if it's a crawler. Uh, I think that if they don't have plugin installed is a better method because if you just look at the user agent, you might end up doing what is considered cloaking. Yeah. So. That and, and cloaking uh, for uh, the broader audience means that you are serving up a content to search engines which is different from what you give to the end users. Right. So if you're giving that to end users who do not have that installed, that's what will end up being served to you, uh, you know, the, the bots anyway, right. irrespective of their use agent. So, so, so if they don't have that installed, you mean it's going to yes. look different? Uh, but you're going to have the same contact, but it, but it would be indexable. Yeah, and that, that and would that's be fine. Legit. Yeah. That would be fine. Okay. Yes. So long you are not tailoring it to the user agent, so long you're not showing it right. something so which if we start putting different information, then yes. what the user would actually see if they had the plugin installed yes. and what the indexer sees, that's not legitimate. They're actually giving different, different, showing different information. Yeah, probably the way to think about it is users which do not have plugin installed, whatever they are seeing, think that that's what Got it. sees. Thank you. So based on comments you made, are you saying that there's no direct link between submitting a sitemap and getting the pages indexed? There is no direct link between submitting a sitemap and getting pages indexed. Mm -hmm. There is a fact that we know that there is a page. That's probably the link. Uh, if you did not submit, there is no guarantee we would know if it was not linked. So that is the main thing. There is no guarantee of any sort because we know about it that we'll index it. Yes. Because we're seeing a uh, similar problem to the gentleman earlier yeah. who said that you know got thousands of links that are submitted via the sitemap uh, that have been submitted for months that still are not showing up in the index. So what what will determine whether or not that will get into the index? Have you have you tried to create a custom sitemap a custom search engine out of that? 
Because if, if you create a custom search engine, you might find that they are being indexed for that. Uh, there is a lot of different factors which go into deciding whether we should include something in our main index or not. And I mean, above everything, think about it, the number of pages which are there on the web are obviously too many. Uh, but that aside, there are other factors, but we do say that, okay, these pages will be available if you are looking at them through uh, custom search engines. When, when you say create a custom search engine, mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean? So custom search engines are uh, a, way, a way Google allows you to create a search engine in which you can say, these are the sites I want you to search whenever a query term is given. This is the kind of weightage we want. So you can create a search engine box, which is really meant to search the index in a specific way. And, and that, how it is to be searched is something you create, and then you can put it anywhere. Like, you know, Google will serve it, but you can put it anywhere. Results will show up the way you want them. Uh, but if you put your site in there, you will see that the pages which you have submitted to us through sitemaps will show up. You know, they might not show up on maingoogle.com, but, <coughs> excuse me, but that is because that's a broader set of things we are looking at, and we might choose not to pick some of those pages. But if you use the custom search engine and you say, my site, you will see that the pages in there will include pages from your site map. Thank you. As a little follow-up to the previous question about checking for a plugin and serving a content that could be different from when the plugin is installed, what happens if you just overlay JavaScript that takes the HTML content of the page and changes it to be more interactive? Um, is that considered cloaking if it's the same content? And there is really no plugin to check here, Java, or unless JavaScript is disabled. I think it would not be considered cloaking, but you have to, I mean, the main thing is that whatever, you can have JavaScript on your page, which changes things, you know, depending on the different situations. But we will try to figure out why you have that JavaScript there and what is it trying to do. Now, for example, if you show a lot of content and the JavaScript goes and hides it, you know, that's, that's a problem. Because the user, the minute they load, and if all that content is hidden, but we are seeing it, that is effectively cloaking. But unless, if there is a meaningful uh, way that that content is being uh, rendered or being used, the key question is, are we seeing what the end user is seeing? The, the, the example here is if I were to serve XHTML, it could possibly serve as a model for my JavaScript application. So I could use it as a, as a data in into the application, mm -hmm. which then essentially serves it in a different way to make it richer, more interactive, and so on. But it's the same content. It's just it would hide the actual markup, potentially, but would essentially s still serve the application based on that content. Yeah, so long you're not, uh, I mean, so long you're just uh, doing that, it should be fine. I mean, JavaScript is OK. It's, like I said, it's only if you are trying to do something which appears more deceptive. Uh, my question is about dynamically generated pages. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if we have a page that takes, say, 10 seconds to actually render, are you guys going to wait for those results, or are you going to move on? If it takes 10 seconds to render, it's hard to tell what will happen, but probably we will get fewer of those pages from your site because we will feel that we will overload your site if we are doing that. Is there any uh, number? That I think if you use webmaster tools, it will like uh, it's not that I, 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 don't, I don't want to tell you. I'm saying that the, the, the tools, you can go and you can submit those and you will see the behavior. I, I don't really know the answer to that. You, okay. can, you can see the behavior. We provide graphs of we try to crawl your site, and this is the kind of latency we are seeing. This is what we are doing. OK, so thanks. you can see that. Is there, yeah, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the extension stuff that mm -hmm. you were talking about. Is there any connection between putting extensions for, say, video or images or news and things showing up in Google's index as news with a video thumbnail, with an image thumbnail? Is there, I mean, is there any actual connection there, or is that sort of so like maybe in the future? I doubt there's a connection in them being selected to be part of the index, but there is indeed uh, a likelihood that the uh, this, uh, uh, the algorithm has more data to look at. So for example, if you say, here is all my images and they show up, yes, it could be. But they could have probably showed up if there were other ways we could have found them. 
Hmm. But uh, the key connection there is discoverability. That okay. you, we were able to discover, and we had a lot of metadata about that as a result. And actually, I would say this to the broad audience. If you want to come up with new extensions for different things, uh, you know, I, I have my business cards here. Please feel free to uh, you know, drop us a line and say, what about extensions for type like this? And we should get into a discussion. Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. And uh, my email is there. Oh, sorry, my email is not there, but uh, my cards are here. Piyush at google.com. Please feel free to uh, contact me if you have any questions.